It's high time that we really just make the point that Socrates was just the first troll. So I want to talk a little bit about the Euthyphro Dilemma, and the best way to talk about the Euthyphro Dilemma is going to be to introduce Socrates, and Socrates is depicted in um, Plato's The Last Day of Socrates right here, and in that book is uh, the dialogue Euthyphro, which the Euthyphro Dilemma draws its name from. Now in it, Socrates and Euthyphro are having an argument about holiness. Discussion, argument. Anyway, Socrates is being irritating. Socrates says he doesn't know what holiness is and that he's currently indicted for impiety kind of because of this. He starts saying, it's like, look, I improvise in discussions on the gods, so I'm being accused of impiety for this. Speaking of, Socrates was a polytheist. Euthyphro was a polytheist. Both of them are polytheists in this discussion. Some people try to make this impiety charge into uh, Socrates being an atheist, and... That, it's not if you read the dialogue. That doesn't make any sense. Their differences come up in this dialogue. Uh, Euthyphro says that he believes that the gods have quarrels and disagreements, and Socrates says he's not convinced of that. But despite that disagreement, they're both polytheists. Now, in this dialogue, Socrates holds the position that he knows nothing. Euthyphro holds that uh, he does know what holiness and right action is. So Socrates places him as the teacher in this conversation and then proceeds to rip him apart through just asking questions constantly. He won't stop. He's, he's Socrates. This is what he was known for, was just being like an irritating person. So the conversation eventually ends with this like weird pretzel of a paradox uh, with the definitions kind of depending on each other. And Socrates is like, we got to start over because I still have no clue what holiness is. And Euthyphro is like, another time. I'm, I've, I'm busy. I got to go. I got a, an appointment I got to get to. And yeah, I'm gone. Bye. Um, and Socrates is kind of making fun of him for this. So anyway, the result of the dialogue is like this weird paradox where while we seem to have intuitions towards right action, we have a lot of difficulty in like providing a definition to it. And Socrates looks at this and he goes, well, then that means we don't know what it is. And to be honest, there's similar words like this that we use, like the word religion and the word art have these issues. As soon as you provide a definition to the word art, someone comes along and, and turns it on its head. Same with religion. As soon as you define religion, any definition of religion that you put forward, there's something out there that is considered a religion that doesn't fit. And this has been a problem in scholastic study of religion for some time, it's such that there is not currently an agreed upon scholastic definition of religion. Now, does this mean that we don't know what religion is? Socrates would say yes. But, you know, regarding art and religion, we have these, these huge discussions about them with a general understanding of what they are. But trying to define either term is a nightmare. <laughs> and goodness and holiness kind of fall into this category. All right, so how does this affect polytheism? Well, it doesn't really at all. Um, the fact that these things are hard to define is paradoxical. And it does mean that grounded goodness in the gods creates issues, you know, but we don't have to do that as a polytheist. You can ground goodness elsewhere and be fine. Like, it's not a big deal. Christians run into a big problem here because they have one, three gods. Wait, no. How do they do that? There's a trinity... They got one God, the Son of God with Jesus, who's also God. He's entirely God. And the Father is God. Okay, anyway, whatever. Christians are confusing when it comes to this whole light trinity thing. But let's just talk about it as if it's one God because that's what they do. The fact is that Christians, you know, they utilize a single deity to fill roles that prior to Christianity were held by many gods. And this results in some internal conflicts. So... You know, it's both a mercy deity and a justice deity at the same time. Omnibenevolent, yet created evil, but isn't responsible for evil. 
whatever. Anyway, Euthyphro's conversation with Socrates wound up inspiring this dilemma that has endured in Christian history, honestly. And it has to do with God being both the sovereign ultimate and the definer of goodness at the same time. Now, I'm going to break down kind of like what I think are the strongest issues that are presented by this dilemma. So one has to choose one of two positions. Either God is the one that defines goodness, or goodness is defined by something that is other than God. Now, this is a true dichotomy. There's no third option here. And it's usually presented as the two horns. Now, horn one, God commands it because it is good. And horn two, it is good because God commands it. Now, I'm gonna, oh my God, there's horns everywhere. All right, I'm gonna put that there. Eh. First horn. The first horn is that goodness is independent of God, but God knows everything about this goodness, and this is reflected in his commands. But this means that the nature of goodness is determined by something other than God, and that would be incompatible with many forms of Christianity. So what about the second horn? Well, here's the second horn. Second horn solves this problem, rooting goodness in God, but in solving this problem winds up creating a whole new one, which is that goodness is arbitrary. <laughs> There's no reason why God's commands are good, except for the fact that God commands them, which means God can command anything. So acts that we consider heinous right now could wind up being good just if God commands them. And some people even take this to mean, well, you know, those big genocidal events in the Bible? Well, they're good. Why? Well, because God commanded them. Both of these horns result in serious issues. Like, I don't know where I'm going to put these. Um, but Christians wind up having to choose between one set of problems or another in order to kind of solve this. Now, for me, I think that the first horn has the least number of issues because the sacrificing of God's sovereignty isn't, like, a huge deal for me. But Christians might feel otherwise. But there is a Christian strategy that I've seen multiple times in which they try and kind of, like, build a third horn and i'm gonna i'm gonna steel man it i don't think it works but i'm gonna we're gonna i'm gonna read a thing essentially what they want to say is that goodness is grounded in god's nature and that his very nature makes him good and this informs his commands now on the outset this seems reasonable but what's actually happening is what i call can kicking the argument it just moves the dilemma into another sphere now we have the same Euthyphro dilemma when it comes to God's nature. Is God's nature good because God made it so? Or did something else make God's nature good? Whoops. Same dilemma, different place. Now, there's a response to that that is that God's nature is eternal. And this is just how it is, like kind of asserting it as a brute fact. But <laughs> this is just the second horn, um, meaning that his nature is arbitrary. It could have been anything. Like, the fact that God's nature is what it is, is mere chance. But if you respond to that and you say, no, here's why certain things are good. And you say anything other than being consistent with God's nature, well, now you've got the second horn because now goodness is rooted somewhere other than God. Things like harm, well-being, any form of principle, any examination of relative moral values, this is all irrelevant at this point, because what matters is whether or not an action lines up with God's nature. And when you examine God's nature, well, it, it includes killing everyone on the planet in the flood. <laughs> That's where we're at. We as humans tend to have moral intuitions, or at least we kind of think we do. And it seems in most cases that killing everybody on the planet in the flood is against those moral intuitions. Now, why is that? Now, or even smaller actions such as the genocide of the Amalekites or killing everybody in Jericho, like these things just don't really appeal to our moral intuitions too much, unless you're, I don't know, a little fucked up. These things are good arbitrarily as one kind of kicks the can down the road of justifications of God's goodness and until there's a commitment to one of the horns. Now, <laughs> so there's either a reason why things are good at which point God sacrifices his sovereignty over goodness, or there's not, at which point goodness is arbitrary. The problem gets deeper when you kind of look at the fact uh, that we examined earlier, which is some of these actions that 
or commands of God don't really line up with the morality of our intuitions. So this puts us in a kind of like a weird instance in which we don't know whether or not our moral intuitions line up with God's, um, <laughs> thereby making knowledge of goodness inaccessible, which kind of sucks because that was the whole point of getting kicked out of the garden. So Pelagius, that excommunicated Celt in the previous video, he wound up kind of getting around this issue. And the way that he did it was he was like, look, we are created in the image of God. And being that we're created in the image of God, that, that like voice that we hear in our heart of hearts, those are our moral intuitions that line up with goodness because we're created in the image of God. Now, the problem with this is that it winds up flying in the face of both original sin and biblical infallibility. Because Pelagius was teaching that like, look, if, if you're having a moment in which your moral intuitions, your heart of hearts, disagree with the text of the Bible, then you discard the text as it's just written by humans. And because <laughs> look, the relationship that you're working on, the one that you're focusing on is the relationship with God and not the relationship with a book. Kind of gets your noggin jogging about idolatry now, doesn't it? But look, this puts the Christian in a really tough place. And it also kind of brings us back to the point where I see this debate crop up every once in a while. And Christians will do this strategy of can kicking and people let them get away with it. And I think that they should stop. So I'm kind of pointing out this issue. And whatever you see the can get kicked, just apply the same dilemma to the location where the can was kicked. Because kicking the can just changes the location of the dilemma. It doesn't actually solve it. Anyway, let me know your thoughts. Uh, this is always a fun subject for me. And Christians, again, like the last video, I definitely want to hear from you guys. Uh, which horn do you take? And where do you stand on this, uh, this can kicking issue? But with that, I want to give a hail to my patrons for making this content possible. It's good to have people at your back. And remember to like, subscribe, and hit the bell with both horns. And remember to find a way or make one.